Um, so I'm so pleased to be welcoming uh, Belle Boggs to Politics and Prose this afternoon to discuss her new book, The Art of Waiting, on Fertility, Fertility Medicine, and Motherhood. It's a contemplative look at the modern experience of reproduction and child rearing, from people who struggle with infertility to people seeking to adopt, um, to gay couples looking to at the possibility of surrogacy. Um, even as she wonders why people sacrifice so much, Boggs admits to not fully understanding her own longing for a child, and her meditative exploration of parenthood includes considerations of a pregnant zoo gorilla, victims of forced sterilizations, um, and the childless lives of artists such as Virginia Woolf. Andrew Solomon, author of Far From the Tree, describes the art of waiting as profound and deeply moving. He writes, her book ponders the nature of reproduction in modern America, which is of necessity a means of pondering the nature of family, which is in turn a means of pondering the nature of intimacy and love. The wisdom comes easily here as Boggs considers the searing pain of disappointment, every structure of uh, proleptic hope, and the widening of human relationships. She does all this and more in luminous, generous prose. Bell Boggs' stories have appeared in many publications, uh, including the Paris Review, Harper's, Slate, and Orion, which published her short story, The Art of Waiting, in 2012, and that story uh, almost immediately went viral. Um, currently, she teaches at North Carolina State University in the MFA program there. Um, Bell will be in conversation today with Dan Kois, culture editor at Slate and co-host of Slate's parenting podcast, Mom and Dad Are Fighting and he is currently working on a book called How to Be a Family. Um, so please join me in welcoming Bell Boggs and Dan Kois to Politics and Press. Thank you so much. That was a really nice introduction, and thank you for coming out on a Sunday afternoon. I'm really happy to be reading um, at Politics and Prose. I used to live in um, D.C., and this is one of my favorite bookstores. So um, anyway, I'm very excited to be here. Um, I'm going to read just a little bit from um, the, a chapter called In the Peanut Hospital. Um, so the book is a collection of essays as well as a nonfiction book that kind of um, tells the story of my experience with infertility and building my family, um, but also looks at um, literature, at science, and at the lives of a lot of other people. This is a um, more memoirish section about um, my relationship with my mother. So um, I'll just read a little bit from this. It's called In the Peanut Hospital. My mother wouldn't tell me the name of her surgery. It was for old ladies and she didn't want to talk about it. No, it wasn't dangerous. Yes, she'd stay the night in a hospital and she wanted me there and at home with her for a few days afterward. My father would be there too, but he wasn't good around sick people or hospitals, though he'd been a sick person in a hospital twice in recent memory. I'm not sick, she assured me. There's nothing wrong with me. It's a female surgery, she said, like that answered things. I made plans to drive to Virginia to the distant hospital in Suffolk where her doctor practiced. We had reservations at a quality inn that looked seedy even on the website, unlike the spiffier Holiday Inn Express, the quality inn would allow my parents' dog. It was August of the hottest year on record. Along the highway, grasses and weeds were yellowed and burnt. Out west, farmers struggled to feed their livestock. Hay was high, water dear. A drought map of North Carolina showed every county in dangerous red-brown territory, and our well at home had to be managed carefully. Brief showers, short laundry cycles, no guests. The Haw River was drained to a bathwater stillness, too low to paddle more than short stretches. What bothers me, a biologist friend told me the last time we were out on the water together, is the idea that there is something wrong with me, the idea that I am damaged, faulty. She was strong, healthy, beautiful, successful. She was also infertile. Our shared condition was why we met through another friend who knew about our mutual struggle. Of course, I told her, you aren't damaged, but her body wasn't working the way she wanted it to, and mine wasn't either. What is wrong with having something wrong with you, I wondered on my drive to Virginia, windows closed, too hot then for anything but the blaring air conditioner. I'd told my mother almost as little about my infertility or treatments as she had now told me about her surgery. Our broken parts, 
the broken female parts at least, were an uncommon silence between us. In Of Woman Born, her book of memoir and cultural criticism about the patriarchy suffused experience of motherhood, Adrienne Rich writes about the need women felt in her youth to present to the world an image of health, industry, and fertility. Already a serious poet when she married at 24, she remembers taking up a broom the day after her wedding, thinking, this is what women have always done. While Rich was ambivalent about how motherhood would affect her ambitions by the birth of her first child, she'd won the Yale Younger Poets Prize. She knew that to have a child was to assume adult womanhood to the full, to prove myself, to be like other women. As a pregnant woman, she had three sons in quick succession. She writes that she felt, quote, for the first time in my adolescent and adult life, not guilty. The atmosphere of approval in which I was bathed, even by strangers on the street, it seemed, was like an aura I carried with me, in which doubts, fears, misgivings met with absolute denial. The pregnant body suggests a story we think we know, health, love, happiness, that pregnancy is in fact a dangerous condition that tends to make women poorer and more vulnerable to violence and some diseases, and certainly less likely to write books, isn't something we talk about. We instead learn early on that the inconvenience is particular to the female body, getting a period, wearing a bra, worrying about becoming or not becoming pregnant, are properly suffered in secret, even in shame. We learn not to talk about doubts, fears, misgivings related to the female body, and we celebrate instead the visible condition of pregnancy, in part because it is so visually obvious, but also because it has been done to a woman and can be seen incorrectly as something she endures or even passively enjoys, rather than something she has to handle. My own mother remembers her 1970s pregnancies with a fondness that emphasizes how natural and intuitive they were. She didn't have an ultrasound for either pregnancy, but knew that I was a girl and that my brother was a boy. In fact, she didn't see a doctor. There were no obstetricians in our county until she was seven months along with me. And he and my mother disagreed about my due date. She was right, the doctor almost a month off. Both of her births were natural births. That was the story she told me, except I learned later for the Demerol she took intravenously in the last stage of labor with me. Of course, I wouldn't have judged my mom for any pain relief she needed, opiates or an epidural or even complete sedation, which Rich experienced for all three of her births. But my mother needed the story of my birth to be about nature taking its course and the perfection of the experience. You didn't even cry, she always told me proudly. Blonde, five feet tall, and 100 pounds, my mother sits on a pillow to see over the steering wheel of her 14-year-old Mercedes station wagon and was once pulled over by a county sheriff who assumed she was a child on a joyride. On school field trips as parent chaperone, she was often mistaken for a student by my teachers and was once yanked up by her hair while she tried to get something out of our lunch bag. That this would be considered an appropriate thing to do to a child is another matter. Her lifestyle is a specialized one. She knows how to build a roaring fire in a wood stove, but not where the gas goes in her car. I've registered several email accounts for her, but she has never checked them, not once. Don't email buttons, bogs at Hotmail or Gmail or any of that. It's not gonna work. Uh, for a small person, she has large bones, big knobby artist's hands, knock knees, her shoes, she has many, none are sneakers, are boats. Scoliosis, uncorrected in her childhood, makes her short torsoed, and her arms and legs are disproportionately long and thin. She excels at rowing, kayaking, and water skiing, and walks like a New Yorker with somewhere to be. I have never seen her run or play a team sport. Before my grandmother died, it was a tradition in my family for the women, my grandmother, my mother, my aunt, to attend their yearly mammograms together on the same day. Maybe you can credit the pervasive pink ribbon campaigns, but breast health appeared to exist in a separate realm from other women's health issues, not a source of embarrassment, but a chance for bonding. On mammogram day, my mother, aunt, and grandmother each took their turn at the imaging machine and then went out for lunch and pedicures. 
Once, when I was in college, Mom had a follow-up appointment at a specialist's office near my apartment in Richmond. I met her there to wait with her, and while she was gone, it felt like hours, I had a panic attack in the waiting room. I felt suddenly as though a lobe of my left lung had slipped through my rib cage and was caught on one of the bones. I couldn't sit up in my chair and had to lean over, breathing shallowly until she returned. Just a problem with the machine, she explained lightly. It took my breathing and posture the rest of the day to recover. Before I had a child, when I imagined what was most terrifying to me, it was always the thought, the loss of my mother. Ostrich-like, I tried to avoid it like thoughts of climate change, water shortages, inevitable cat catastrophes a long way off. It was the greatest disaster that could happen as Virginia Woolf remembered the death of her own beloved mother. William Maxwell, another writer who lost his mother young, fictionalized mother loss in So Long, See You Tomorrow, similarly as the worst that could, could happen. I suppose what I was most afraid of when I thought of losing my mother was an untethering from family, from female kind. Who would wait with me in a few years while I took my turn at the mammogram machine? My brother called us the non-kid-having cousins because all of our adult cousins had children while we, in our way, were children. Still reporting our achievements to our parents, eager for their approval. We had no non-kid-having models in our family. Our surfer, surfer uncle had a son and his son had two kids. Our unstable aunt, two kids still in college or so we were told. My dad's brothers had kids and their kids had kids. We weren't even sure how many at this point, while our parents, for years, talked of grand dogs and grand cats. I waited with Gus, my parents' mini schnauzer, and a fine approximation of a toddler while my mother completed the pre-op paperwork in the hospital, and my dad paced the parking lot talking on his cell phone. Mini schnauzers are known for attaching fiercely to one owner, and Gus is heartbroken when my mother leaves him. He splayed at my feet on the hot sidewalk, dejected. Occasionally, he thought he recognized a walker to neighbor, ambling in or out of the hospital's automatic doors, and perked up and stood at attention until the stranger passed without admiring him. She didn't have a good feeling about the hospital, my mother said on her return, bending to take Je Gus's gently offered paw was so far from home and everyone inside looked sick. Not hospital sick, she said, life sick. Why hadn't she switched doctors already? Her mother was gone and she barely spoke to my aunt, but here we were, suffering in Suffolk. The hotel, the motel had a turbid greenish swimming pool and the non-smoking room smelled of smoke. We killed time by carefully checking the beds for bed bugs, scratching imaginary bites, changing into rooms that weren't any better, and walking Gus around the far corners of the property where we could find the shade and privacy he required to do his business. We were the first party seated at the only sit-down restaurant in town. The next morning, we checked Mom into the surgical center. She looked smaller than ever on the gurney when we kissed her goodbye. I wasn't worried about the surgery exactly. I knew it was r low risk and that she'd spend only a single night in the hospital. My dad and I took turns walking around the hospital, which had been donated by and named for the Obichi family of Planner's fe Peanut Fortune. A Mr. Peanut statue greeted patients in the lobby. The gift shop sold a complement of little peanut baby gifts, onesies, bibs, blankets, though I read in a commemorative hospital exhibit that Amadeo and Luisa Vici could not have children. The display suggested that they focused instead on charity work, on helping the children in their community. I thought of two of my friends at home, both going through their first IVF cycles. I would miss our support group meeting this month but I imagined using my turn around the table in September to tell the story of wandering the peanut hospital while my mom had some unnamed female surgery. This was what I liked best about attending the group, storytelling, recounting the lowest or strangest moments of the month before. Though lately, it felt as though we had devolved to more practical discussions. Which doctor to consult, which pills to try, which medication to inject where. Maybe we've evolved instead. Maybe the practical was more helpful. I thought this sometimes until we returned next month and found that pills and supplements and injections described so earnestly the month before 
hadn't worked. The narrative failed because it was about only one thing, becoming pregnant. I needed my story to be more flexible. So I'll stop there so we can have time to talk. Thank you. Hey. Hi. These are already on, right? They okay. sure are. Uh, so I'm Dan Coyce. Uh, I work at Slate. Um, I've known Bell for a long time. Uh, I'm a partisan for this book. Uh, and I'm going to ask her some questions, and then we'll take questions from you. Uh, we'll talk for maybe 15, 20, 25 minutes total. Um, when you guys do ask questions, please ask them from these microphones on the side. We'll tell you when it's time. Um, also, just please ask great questions, just really, really great questions. OK. Um, so hi, Bill. Hi, Dan. Uh, OK, so the first question I have for you um, is about how you decided to start writing about this particularly like this is as the work uh as you said at the beginning um and as many people have noted is a mix of journalistic reporting um sort of literary essay and personal memoir um and as a journalist it makes sense that this is like a rich topic to dig into there's lots of people to talk to there are people who want to tell you their stories um it's not been that well reported on by a lot of people but as someone who also writes personally how did you decide, oh, well, this is, I want to tell this kind of story, and I want to write from both sides? Thanks. Um, that's a great question. It, um, so, you know, I'm a fiction writer by training and by um, just kind of how I identify. And I was actually approached by Orion Magazine after my first book came out, a collection of stories, and um, asked if I would like to write something fiction or nonfiction for them. And I was going through infertility at the time. I had started fertility treatments, and they were not going well at that point. Um, and I um, had been going to the support group for a while. And I said, you know, actually, I've been reading a lot of your essays, and I, I like the, the essay writing in your magazine, so I'd like to try something like that. And I, I felt drawn to the subject at first because it just felt like something, the thing that I had the most to say about. And also, um, but I wanted to tell the story in a different way that didn't just focus on my own experience. I'm always really interested in writing about setting and nature and place. And so I thought that this was something that I could connect to the landscape around me in North Carolina. And um, I had some idea that I could use um, some of the scientists and researchers in the area to make it a little bit more, you know, at Orion, they say Orion-y the way you guys say slaty. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so I, I could make it more Orion-y that way. And so I kind of came to the editor with this idea. And it was just for an essay. It was not for a book. I just said, well, I have this idea that I'll write something about infertility and what I want to find out if there's, in, you know, what, what it's like when there's infertility in the natural world and how it affects non-human primates, and then I'm also interested in writing about IVF um, and why there's a resistance to IVF in our culture. And I you know, had a, through a bunch of other things in the mix, like Virginia Woolf and um, Tilly Olson. And, and luckily, the editor was you know, very flexible and said, OK, well, we'll try that. <laughs> and so I don't know if she had any expectation that I would continue to follow that thread. But that's, so that's how I started. And, and so um, I wasn't sure after I wrote the first piece that I would keep writing about it, but I, I think I had an idea that I pitched to you. And so that experience continued to, that was an experience where I went and um, met with an embryologist. And I really wasn't, no, I didn't know what that would be like, um, and an embry embryologist who worked at, at UNC. And we didn't meet at the treatment clinic, but at her lab where she talked about her research. And it was so interesting, and she was just such a warm and effusive and interesting person that um, I just got more and more interested in meeting people who are working in this um, in this field in different ways. It's interesting to hear you say, like, this was the thing I felt like I had the most to say about. In a way, it seems like because it was the it was the the thing you were going through at that time. Like, if someone, if a friend asked you what was up, well, that was what was up. Right, except I wouldn't have told them. I would just right. say it was fine. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, uh, but it isn't, you know, in the context of that of the bit of the essay you just read where you talk about how frequently these things just don't get talked about even between people who are really close like the decision to then write about it in a great deal of detail and to 
frame it in terms of the reporting that you do and the people that you talk that you talk to ended up being very interesting to me. So as you kept writing these essays, um, this simultaneously it seems with that the the collection of essays started to return to publishing to serious publishing as like a, a viable commercial form in mm -hmm. great deal due to Gray Wolf, your publisher. Um, was there some point at which you said, oh, I get it, that this is a book that I'm doing? Or did it take someone to tell you that? Um, you know, a couple of people, I think you said something to me, and then my friend, oh, right, right, right. <laughs> and, my fr and my friend Duncan Merle. So I feel like I ha in my life, I'm really lucky to have people who are, um, you know, sort of nonfiction mentors for me because I didn't study nonfiction. And so um, when, you know, I don't have nonfiction professors to turn to or, and so people I knew professionally, like you, like Duncan, uh, Kim Damon, Dana Kupperman, a friend of mine who's a Grey Wolf writer, um, Eula Biss um, was really encouraging also, and I'm a, a big fan of hers. So um, that made me think that I could try. And so I wrote a proposal. Um, that um, I guess I finished the proposal, or I, I wrote the proposal in 2013, and um, and so that you know now it's 2016, so it seems a little like a while ago, but it, it was a, you know it was a while after I'd started writing in the topic, and when I was working on the proposal, it helped me see that oh because in a proposal you know they're kind of scarily not that hard to write, <laughs> it's actually really hard to write the book, but the proposal itself seems. You know, you know, you just kind of make an outline and say what I, you're I could to do. write this book. Yeah, yeah. I would, totally. This is this book will be easy. And so when I was writing the proposal, I was writing all the areas that were that I wanted to explore that I hadn't explored yet, and it seemed exciting to me and seemed like something that I could do. And at that time, you know, Grey Wolf, I I love my press. I'm really so lucky to be there, and they were having, you know, they were, you know, they've always been very enthusiastic about areas of publishing that the big, you know, some of the bigger houses um, don't put at their front, the front of their list, like short story collections, or poetry, <laughs> um, essay collections. And so I knew that if I took a proposal to them that they would read it really seriously. Uh, and they've had a lot of success with Leslie Jameson and Yula, who you mentioned. Are there other collections of essays sort of revolving around a certain topic that you have loved that you found a reason to dip into as you were putting this together? Well, um, this is not, they're not really collections of essays, but I love Andrew Solomon's work, and I love the way that his, um, his t big books on depression and then on family, the way that he uses his own experience to teach you about his entry into um, the, the subject, this is why I'm very interested in depression, or this is why I'm very interested in families and children who are different um, in some way from their families and how their families raise them. And then the um, immense reporting that he does. Um, of course, I love um, both um, Eula's, I mean, uh, both of Eula's books with Grey Wolf, um, Notes from No Man's Land and On Immunity, Leslie Jameson's book. Um, uh, it, the empathy exams is phenomenal. I love uh, Claudia Rankin and um, her and Citizen. I was something that I was reading when I was like finishing up some of the work in this book. Um, a, a collection of essays that's not a recent collection of essays that I've been a writer that I've been really into recently, um, who write wrote nonfiction and fiction is the Italian writer Natalia Ginsberg, and um, her collection of essays. Um, the Little Virtues is incredible, and it's an incredible, beautiful book that's about, you know, they're not necessarily connected thematically, except that they're all about her personal life, um, um, sometimes in exile from fascism in Italy, and sometimes about her artistic life, but there's also a lot in there about parenting and family and what she thinks about being an artist mother, and um, so that was, um, Th th that's something that I've thought about a lot recently. And of course, always Tilly Olson's silences. Uh, you were a school teacher for a long time, including here in DC. I think one of your former coworkers is here. Is that right? Mm -hmm. What was the school? A couple. Kip. <laughs> um, um, sh it's, it's the Kip School in Shaw, um, part of the Kip DC network, Kip Will Academy. Uh, being a teacher, were you was it elementary or middle that you were teaching? I can't remember. It's we. I, I taught fifth grade. With okay. Joey. <laughs> Hanging out with fifth graders. Uh, I mean, in your twenties and early thirties, did that change the way you thought about kids and parenting? And did that? And did it 
change the way you thought about yourself as a possible one-time future parent? I mean, one of the kind of, um, well, I, you know, I, I, I've taught in one way or another. That's m mostly what I've done in my career. And so even before I taught at the KIPP school, I, I taught elementary school in Brooklyn. And um, But this, living here in D.C. and teaching at the KIPP school, that was when I first realized that I had, um, that there was a fertility problem. And part, one of the messages that a lot of people get about infertility is like, well, it's just, you know, you're too stressed out and you should just, you know, relax a little bit. And that is not possible when you work at KIPP. <laughs> so um, you cannot relax. <laughs> you cannot not be stressed out. Um, or if you can, you're, it's incredible if you can, but I didn't know anyone who was not stressed out. And so uh, for a long time while I was working there, I just thought, well, it's just because this is such a difficult, I'm just having a difficult year. And so actually that messaging, I think it impeded my, um, you know, imp impeded my realization that I needed to get better medical help sooner. But um, I also think that yes, like working with kids, it's, um, you know, it's consuming, it's, you know, you don't have to um, want children um, of your own to work with kids um, and to be a great, I, I write a little bit about that and how so many of my um, favorite teachers were not, um, not parents. And, um, but the, you know, I would think often, I thought often actually of, of my experience as a first grade teacher, because that's just such a magical age, six or seven. And so I thought often about like times that I spent with those kids and, and that that was something that I would miss out on because that, that, lit that literature, that, that age of literature, like the Arnold Lobel fan and, all the things that you read to kids at that age, the things that you do with kids that age were, were the things that most attracted me to parenting. And I remember actually when you had your family, first had your family, and I, that was when I was teaching in New York. And at the time I thought, Dan is crazy. This is like, so he's so young to have kids. And then, and so I thought that, and then I also thought- I was like 30. I know, but I th <laughs> that seemed really young to me. Or I, I, and then I also my with my own children. They would say I had a little. I had a, a child that I just adored in my first grade class, and I remember drawing this picture. We were I don't know why we were doing this, but we were like drawing a picture of a room and labeling it. And I was like drawing a bed, and I was drawing my bedroom, and I was like. I drew two pillows, and he said, why are there two pillows? And I said, oh, that's, for, that's my pillow, and that's my husband's pillow. And he said, oh, you're going to have a baby. And I said, no. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not, Daniel. I'm too young to have a baby. And then, and then you know, I was like like 26 or something. And then I, uh, and then I realized, oh, my gosh, a lot of my kids' parents are actually younger than I am. And so it was just you know, these two different narratives going on in my head at the same time. Um, and so now you teach at NC State, yes. uh, undergraduates and graduates. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I really love about this book is the way that you, is your curiosity about talking to people um, and your interest in, as you say, finding scientists and other people to, to tell, to talk about their stories, both the sort of personal life stories and scientific journeys that they're going on. Um, do you find that it is hard to get your students to get excited about the idea of letting other people's voices or ideas inform their writing? And do you encourage them to like get out and interview people, even if it's for fiction, or uh, even if they don't think of themselves as reporters? Yeah, you know, I do, and I teach. I'm really lucky that so far I've been able to teach. Ever, we teach two classes a semester, and so far I've been able to always teach one fiction, one nonfiction class. So. And I love teach. I love teaching both, but in some ways, I think it's a little easier to teach nonfiction because you there's this you know there are these steps that you can give people. Go out and meet someone interesting. Talk to them. Ask them questions. Or go observe something. And I do talk to my fiction students about that too. And it you know it's it's just. It kind of depends on the project, and it kind of depends on the person and their pers and their personality. But with the nonfiction students, they do a lot of reporting and going out and meeting people, and getting to know other people's stories. But I think also there's this other, th um, at least in the way that I teach nonfiction, which is not to say that it has to be taught this way, but partially I teach it the way that I came to it, which is that I look for what access I have. So do I, you know? Is there someone that I'm connected to, or some experience that I care? deeply about or that I'm connected to that can give me some kind of entry point to this story. And so 
I think that works both for the fiction writers and for the nonfiction writers. Uh, the writer Suki Kim wrote an essay this summer for the New Republic, uh, which was about the response to her book about North Korea, um, in which she embedded in North Korea for uh, for a time teaching there, uh, and then wrote a book about that experience. Um, and she was very upset that it kept getting categorized as a memoir, that people kept referring to it as a memoir, putting it on memoir lists. She felt that that was demeaning in some way or diminishing to the all the reportage and like and journalistic work that she had put into that. Uh, and so now you you have this book that is a mix of these two things, right? That is part essay, part memoir, part reporting. Um, do you feel comfortable calling it a memoir or a hybrid memoir? Do you have you had the experience of people setting the work aside or diminishing the work that you've done because it's about family, because you're a woman, because they just don't understand what the book is? I think she had a really good point about her book and the way that it was being seen in the media, especially because I think by comparison to some other books on the same topic, she wasn't getting the same kind of treatment. Um, for me, um, I don't call it a memoir. I, I mean, if I do, I call it a hybrid, sort of like I think you said earlier. Um, but it doesn't, you know, if someone, you know, buys the book and reads it, it doesn't matter that much to me what they call it. They can call it fiction if they, I mean, you know, whatever they want to call it, that's fine. But, um, but I, I mean, I think that, um, you know, it's important to me, the non-memoir aspects of the book are important to me, and that was important to have in the book. That's not to say that I don't love reading memoirs and have friends who are really wonderful at bringing their own personal, you know, I have some really wonderful memoirist friends, like my friend Krista Bremer. She writes about her family, and she writes about personal experience with so much beauty and so much detail and so much narrative. And um, you know, I can admire that and at the same time feel that I do something a little bit different. And so I feel heartened when people, uh, you know, note the reporting and the, um, and the research that I did too, because that, um, that's important to me. Um, so I guess the shorter answer is it doesn't matter to me what people call it, but, um, but I'm glad if people recognize it does a little of both. Your GRE test prep book, The Art of Waiting, was really fantastic, Belle. <laughs> Uh, so, okay, so in this presidential campaign, um, I think probably most people in this room would not argue that much about which candidate seems most focused on family and women's issues. Um, but let's say Hillary wins. Um, what are the kinds of family-related and education-related reforms that you would love to see move to the top of the list? Yeah, well, this matters um, so much to me. And um, I, it's funny, I was actually at a reading in Minneapolis earlier in the week, and I was reading with this really wonderful woman who writes about motherhood and, um, and being a writer, and she runs these kind of motherhood and writing groups. And she said, you know, I just think that motherhood has made me a better writer. And it's partially because I have so little time that I know that I have to make the most of my writing time. And then she turned to me and said, you know, do you think that's true? Do you feel like motherhood and having so little time makes you a better writer? And I said, no, I think that's bullshit. <laughs> um, so um, I don't think I actually said that. I got that so there, angry but, while yeah. you were saying that. <laughs> I know. So. You know, it's, I, f I feel on the one hand, I'm so grateful. For a long time, I thought I would never have a family. And I'm so grateful to have, I mean, I thought I would never have a child. And I'm so grateful to have my child that I feel sometimes, I feel bad to complain that it's so hard. Um, but at the same time, I feel also when I think back about it and I think about it, um, and I think about my friends and the struggles of my friends and other people I know, that there are there's so few supports for so many of us at every level. So the so level of support for someone in my state when they, I'm from North, I live in North Carolina. So when someone in North Carolina has trouble conceiving, um, and they want to um, pursue um, IVF or any type of assisted reproduction, they have a battle with their um, insurance co company, and you know their insurance company is not required to um, pay for much of anything. Um, then um, if they get lucky and they have the child, then there's no guaranteed leave, 
um, there's no guarantee that you won't be fired, that if you're fired um, for taking leave that you need, that you, um, you know, will be able to get your job back or that you'll have good employment, um, uh, that, that you won't be, you won't suffer from employment discrimination. At, um, even at, uh, you know, I, I work in a, I work at a great university. I'm so happy to be there. Um, but we don't have um, child care. We have like one child care center for the whole university. And that child care center has spots for like, I mean, this is a big school. It's like, to, you know, like 20,000 students and 6,000 um, staff and faculty members. There's like 50 spots in the daycare center. The daycare center costs um, like $1,300 a month, and that's with a subsidy. So it's this, you know, a, and then, you know, the, I think you have to pay taxes on the extra subsidy. So, I mean, this is just, I'm just talking about my own feelings about, my, you know, the experiences that have touched me, but I mean, I think first of all, um, you know, supporting parents, supporting healthcare, you know, because healthcare supports parents and children and families, and then, um, you know, I think that the edu you know, as an educator, we know that the, you know, it's been decided a long time ago uh, or determined a long time ago that the way to um, help outcomes is to provide universal pre-K. I mean, that's like, the, you know, pe people, who researchers decided that or determined that a long time ago, and yet we have no universal pre-K. In fact, kids go to school later than they used to. Um, in a lot of places. So I think there's a lot of work to be done, and I hope that Hillary will be the one to do it. So, uh, Okay, so I want to open it up to questions from you guys. Um, we have microphones here and here. Um, everyone who's been nodding along, please come on up and uh, ask Bella a question, or just tell her how great she is. <laughs> That's also fine. Yes? This is Barb from, so, uh, okay. <laughs> You're great. There you go, I'll go sit down. Um, go ahead. Oh, this this is Barbara Kalora, who's um, the CEO, and um, uh, um, she's in charge of Resolve, the National Infertility Association, which is so important to me and to so many people that I know in helping to um, establish this network of people who can um, lean on each other for support, support um, in um, you know, almost every community, if there's not a Resolve support group, you can start your own. Additionally, they do so much great advocacy and just had recent success um, in Congress last week. So I'm r just really um, honored that you came. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for writing this book. And so many, many people who go through infertility, they have their own story. They have their either their ax to grind. They had... Um, some amazing experience or they had some terrible experience and when they come through it they want to write a book so at resolve we get calls every single week <laughs> I wrote a book I wrote a book I wrote a book and I feel like they all have you know this message right they are they like they had that thing that no one told them they had this amazing experience they want to make sure everyone has that so thinking about your book and your you know, reasons for writing it. Do you, do you have any of those? Like for all of the people that are gonna come behind you who have infertility, is there something in your book, or is there something that you really were like, I need to make sure everybody knows this, and that they, they, they think about this and they find this out, because I, I need to make sure they all know that. I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, well, I think that a lot, you know, one of the one of the reasons that I wrote the book in part was to, you know, and aside from wanting to write a, you know, write a work of nonfiction, um, is that I wanted to build community. I felt very lonely. I felt isolated in my experience, and I wanted to find about find out, you know who else was out there who's experiencing something like what I was experiencing. And the people that I talked to were really pretty, you know, a lot of them were really different in some ways from, you know, in the, the way that they were just choosing to build their families or, um, you know, in the struggles that they'd had. But there was just so, you know, we very quickly could get to a point where we were talking about a lot the same struggle, the same experiences of feeling like, 
being left out or really desiring something that was extremely hard or experiencing financial difficulty. So I guess the message that I would have is just that you're not alone because that was, I mean, that's kind of what I learned by going to Resolve. So it's not really a message that's much different. Resolve, you know, make sure that everyone who comes to Resolve um, Advocacy knows one in eight. That's the number of um, American um, couples who experience um, some form of infertility. And so that's a lot of people. And knowing not only that you're not alone, or if you're not someone who'd experienced infertility, knowing that there's actually someone you know in your life who's experienced the, experiencing this probably right now, and they may not be able to talk about it. Um, but you know that you can be sensitive to it was, um, I guess that would be my message. I mean, it is interesting that for we can talk about the different ways you can categorize this book, but for a lot of people, this book is going to be a kind of self-help book, right? It's a thing for people who are specifically experiencing this issue right now, reading this book is a way to feel like you are not alone in the world. Uh, and it has a very sort of therapeutic goal in that way. And, and there are other, and you know, for people like me who are reading it when we're at a point in our lives when fertility is just no longer an issue for us, uh, it, it reads one way, but it's a great reminder that there's a whole community of people out there in the world for whom this book serves a, a, a more important basic therapeutic purpose. Other questions? Come on up. Don't be shy, guys. Yes, come on up. I can say she's great. <laughs> yeah, that's required, yes. I guess I have a comment and a question. I haven't read the book yet, but I did just buy it. One is that... Um, I am a mother of an adopted son, of adopted son, and I just maybe to point out that infertility is not just trying to get pregnant, but it's bringing a baby to term right now. I I think you cover that in the book, but I was just wondering if you want to comment on that. And the other you may or may not want to talk about is because there is this sort of value placed, I think, on mothers versus childless women. Would the book be different, or would you have written the book had you not? Been able to conceive and have a child. Congratulations! <laughs> oh, thank you, Linda. That's um, so. Um, I do write about one of the things that you know. I was writing the book while I was going through um, just this time of not just infertility, but also decision making. And um, while my husband and I were trying to figure out what we were going to do, and we had all uh, options open. You know, we were keeping an open mind to all options we considered and pursued for a while adoption, we considered foster care, we considered um, um, living child free. And um, so I talked to people who um, have families um, in all of those categories. And that was important to me in, you know, in writing the book. And it was helpful to me too as, and it, it's not that I said, oh, I'm going to write the adoption chapter and figure out if that's the way that I'm going to go. But, you know, I was just interested in the complexity of all the different decisions you have to make and also all the financial resources you have to have in all of those realms. And then all the lack of support um, that we have for families in all of these realms too. The challenges of LGBT families who are trying to grow their families either through adoption or through um, assisted reproduction productive technology that was really interesting to me as well and one of the things that I you know I felt that it was important that um, you know if I was going to try um, you know that if, if, if we were going to try IVF um, which is eventually how we conceived our daughter that um, you know I needed to know that if it d if we weren't successful that I would be okay and so that was um, you know that was a that was one motivation for interviewing people and for researching, um, for doing the research that I did. So, um, you know, I think by the time I realized that I was going to be okay, no matter what happened, um, I, you know, was really invested in the work and interested in seeing it through. So I'm sure that it would be different because I did complete a lot of the book after my daughter was born, but it th I think it would exist. It would, be, it would probably be a little bit different, but she's not in the book very much. Um, and that's also partially by design. Um, you know, I wanted it to be, it's painful, you know, to people, I think to, you know, it can be painful to um, have, um, you know, to have, 
have that kind of outcome in front of you all the time, or to have someone exalting children all the time can be, um, you know, can be really painful. So right. you talk about that a lot in the book about the way that messages get received when someone's struggling with fertility, the way you receive all those very casual messages people put out in the world about their kids and their family life and how it affects you differently when you're, when you're struggling with yeah. that. Yeah, and I think, you know, and I think there's something a little bit protective also about, you know, not knowing what it will be like before, you know, before you, I, you know, I don't think that I, w I fully knew what it would be like before I, you know, bef before I had my daughter. And I think, th you know, I think that was probably just by, by design a helpful protective thing. All right, so we have time for one more question. It can come from you guys or it can come from me, but it will be better if it comes from you guys. I have to concur, too, that, you know, Belle is amazing. Yep. Uh, so we're good there, right? All right, my question really is about um, your husband and the toll that it takes on your partner, whether that be, you know, your husband or a partner. Um, how is that support... Um, how does that support grow from him in your case and how that kind of impacted you over time um, since you, you know, this was a long period of time trying to come to terms with your situation? I'd also follow up with, I would love to know your sense of how he was processing your writing of this book as it went along and, and uh, if he was 100% on board or if he's actually sitting back there right now so angry. <laughs> I don't think, he, <laughs> I think he was 100% or at least like 98% on board. <laughs> and um, so that, you know, my husband is a writer also and that helps um, to have, um, you know, cause, so he knows the value of self-expression, but of course I checked everything over with him before I, um, you know, before I published uh, um, most everything. And so, but, it, you know, it, for partners, it is different. And um, in some ways, if they're, you know, the, if you're talking about ART, you're talking about um, most of the clinical aspect or the medical, you know, most of, most of what's being done medically to, you know, one person is being done to the person who's going to carry the child. Um, and so um, there is, you know, th that makes for this kind of imbalance. And people think that it's all emotionally about, you know, the person who's longing to carry the child. And so th I think there's a lot of neglect of the feeling of the other partner. And um, particularly if that other partner is a man. And um, so at our support group, actually, it was um, really nice that um, we had a number of um, couples who would come together every time. I think there was, so there were always like, I don't know, maybe three or four men around the table too who were going through um, infertility at the same time as um, you know as, the, as their partner or their wi wives. And so I don't know that they ever really talked to each other outside of the group, but um, but the fact that we could talk at the group was really really helpful. And you know I'll say Richard was always we, he went with me every time. He went with me to every doctor's appointment. He was you know there to give all the shots, and so he was. That was, uh, you know, I, I couldn't obviously have done it, or, you know, I could have done it by myself, I guess, but it would have, you know, it was, it's really meaningful to me that he was there for me, and, and it is also really meaningful to me that he was supportive while I was writing the book. And he's also a great researcher, so if I ever had a, he's, <laughs> um, so if I ever had a question about something, well, how does this work legally, and how, you know, what, who is the person I should talk to? Um, he was someone I could ask, so that was, um, that was great. Uh, all right, the book is called The Art of Waiting. If you haven't bought it, please buy it. You can also get Belle's Book of Stories, Mad About I Queen. It's up at the front. It's also really good. Uh, thank you, Belle. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming, everyone. Oh, and she's signing. You're signing, right? Yeah. So come get all your Bell Boggs books and body parts signed up front. <laughs>